at Nieuwe Institute for today's event, Reimagining Future African Cities. And thank you so much all for being here on this very sunny Saturday afternoon. In this weekend, my name is Nadia Truman. I'm one of the program managers here at the Institute, and I will be your host today. So we're delighted to present talks and conversations today around the future of African cities. And we're not doing this alone. We are collaborating with this with uh, Prince Klaus Fund African Architecture Matters and Creative Industry Fund NL, aka Stimuleringsfonds. So a special welcome to you all, to all who have traveled and are here. Um, but before we take off on the program, I would like to invite Eric Chen, our general and artistic director to say a few words. Thank you, Nadia, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, as Nadia mentioned, I'm general and artistic director here at the New Institute. Uh, and for those of you, uh, of you who may not be so familiar with us, uh, the one-liner is we are the Netherlands National Museum and Institute for Architecture, Design, and Digital Culture. Um, and uh, you know, among the things that we do or that we try to do um, is we tr through our research programs uh, and wide array of national and international initiatives, uh, we try to become a to, to create a, uh, testing grounds for, for collaboration between leading practitioners, thinkers, and broad audiences uh, in critically addressing uh, many of the urgencies that we uh, face today. Now, the international part is very important to us. For one, it's part of our assignment, uh, but perhaps more to the point, um, uh, we believe very strongly that especially in the current uh, geopolitical climate, uh, it's more important than ever for all of us to uh, know each other, uh, uh, learn from each other, uh, work together, and understand each other. Now, for when it comes to Africa, this, this you know, very big, complex, diverse place, uh, we've been privileged uh, uh, in recent years to have worked with quite a number of amazing uh, African and African diasporic uh, practitioners and researchers and others. Um, uh, the most recent example is Kunle Adeyemi's uh, Water Cities installation, which we hope you have a chance to see uh, if you haven't already. We've, of course, also been very inspired by Leslie Loco's curation of uh, this year's Venice Architecture Biennale and its recentering of, uh, of narratives, methodologies, and approaches uh, through uh, an Afrocentric and uh, African diasporic lens. Um, but, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, as often happens, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Uh, and for us, um, I was, well, on my part, uh, I was re-watching last night Lagos, Lagos Cool House, which is the uh, film shot in 2001 uh, by Brechtia van der Haak uh, that sort of followed Rem, who, you, who will be here later today to reflect uh, on his experiences back then, uh, 20, 25 years ago in Lagos. I'd followed him around, uh, and at one point, uh, he had been apparently asked off camera uh, what prompted his interest uh, in Lagos, and his response ended with something along the lines of, and I was a bit embarrassed that there was this important part of the world that I knew so little about. Uh, and that, I have to say, has resonated with me, so we want to thank, I want to thank uh, Prince Klaus Fund, uh, Marcus de Sandos, uh, the director and uh, their amazing team, uh, Stimularings Funds, Sib Grunveld, uh, and Marcus will be here later, uh, Sib Grunveld uh, of Stimularings Funds and his amazing team and African Architecture Matters for helping us overcome our embarrassment uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really look forward to uh, continuing not just conversations but also developing uh, long-term collaborations that will help us uh, learn from each other and work together. And on that note, thanks again and back to Nadia. Thank you, Eric. So I'll quickly walk you through the program of today. It's a three-part program, which will start off with the Building Beyond team having a conversation on prescribed futures. Afterwards, we will have a presentation, a conversation by African Architecture Matters Foundations for the Future. Um, we will hope that you will all join us afterwards for network drinks where we encourage you to mingle and talk to each other. Then there's also the time to visit the exhibition Water Cities Rotterdam by Kulna Edeyemi, if you so wish. And then at six, we will have our third part, Revisiting Lagos with Rem Kolhas. The event is sold out. For those of you that do not have a ticket, please do stay along. Uh, maybe seats will open up. It is a Saturday after all, so who knows? Maybe people have other things to do, but we hope you can stay for all of it. And then the bar will be open to 10, at, till 10. Um, and then I would like to invite Nzinga Mbup to the stage uh, to, for the Building Beyond presentation. Yes. 
Hello, everybody. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, thanks for hosting us. Thanks to the new institute and for everybody that took the time to come. Uh, I've been uh, tasked with uh, introducing the, the program uh, on behalf of uh, the other mentors and all the participants as well. Um, Building Beyond is an alternative educational program that aims at fostering thought leadership, promoting criticality and reframing design-based practices. It brings together 12 artists and designers who will be reimagining the future of their cities through design and creative problem solving, guided by four mentors. Hailing from 12 African countries, um, namely South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, Nigeria, Benin Republic, Morocco, and Senegal, these creatives work in a wide range of design fields that include architecture, urbanism, digital design, visual arts, photography, research, and performance. Throughout the year, the group comes together online. Let me actually show you the picture of the group. <laughs> Throughout the year, the group comes together online to jointly reflect on the future of cities and communities, whilst each developing a concept that fits into their wider practice. With this program, we aim to contribute to an ongoing conversation on how creative practices rooted in locality and community can lead to new perspectives and promote transformative urban agendas that change how we inhabit our world. So now a little bit on why we're here and um, throughout the year we've, uh, especially as mentors, have uh, helped to foster certain conversations surrounded um, around uh, particular themes um, and uh, organized in three chapters. In uh, the first chapter, we um, looked or tried to center the idea of holding space, both for the participants, but also reflect on how we do it in each of our geographies and context. And uh, in the second chapter, our focus wo wo was on the modes of expulsion uh, and modes of engagement. Um, and uh, the themes were born out of discussions with the participants. And um, we've been able to foster moments of summoning perspective practices, but also um, kind of crafting design strategies and tactics on how we can better engage with both our topics um, and our context. So we're also very um, um, happy to have moments of transmitting these ideas to the public, which today is a moment to do so, but there will be an ongoing, um, there's a publication that is being worked on and that should be published next year by our really wonderful editorial team, which is actually uh, some of the participants uh, within the, the group, this cohort. So now to introduce the showcase. In this series of panel discussions, we discuss various elements of the paradox between the prescribed futurity of the African city, in which the lived reality grapples with the present while carrying remnants of the past. We look at how the proposed future of the African city is fueled by unsustainable dynamics and discuss alternative tools, methods, such as using vernacular as a technology, mapping resonances and spatial imaginations and what it can bring. The first panel is entitled The African Anthropocene. It will be moderated by myself, uh, Zingamboop, and the participants, Wezile, Nike, and Uzoma, who share their presentation. The second panel is entitled Vernacular Technology. It will be moderated by mentor Hisham Bouzid and the participants um, Femi, Arafa, and not Rose, sorry. <laughs> um, and? And Ellen, sorry, uh, will uh, also share their presentation and reflection on the topic. Uh, thirdly, um, Cities of Resonance, held by uh, or moderated by mentor Ola Hassanian, uh, with participants Bill Keys, Helen, and Sarah, who, oh, sorry, and Rose and Sarah, who actually um, also um, re reflect on the theme. And lastly, um, Ken Sani will moderate the panel between imaginary and image uh, with Mikael, Rania, and Anna. And uh, we hope you have also some time to engage with us. Uh, at the end of each panel, we'll normally have five minutes for probably one or two questions. And I think at the end, there'll be a bit more time for discussion. And we can very much look forward to it. So thank you. So 
So now we'll actually start <laughs> with the first panel, uh, we shall moderate. <laughs> I would like to invite uh, the uh, panelists, uh, uh, Nick and Uzoma, to join me on the stage, please. A warm welcome. <laughs> So, to introduce the first um, panel entitled The African Anthropocene, I just want to share a bit, um, some words um, before opening up um, the panel. African capitals and cities bear the heritage of colonial cities um, that were often built on the expulsion of indigenous communities and the extraction of natural resources. Leslie Loco, at the opening conference of this year Venice Biennale, reminded us that the African body was the Western world first unit of energy. The African continent and its people continue to supply the world with resources and energy that constantly shape our built environment and reframe our economies and ecologies. From the acid mine water underlying Johannesburg after centuries of gold exploitation, to the intensification of cotton mining in the DRC to produce electric cars, Africans have to grapple with the legacy of the extraction industry and how it's shaped our territories. We are now at a point where we are preoccupied with shedding the systems that no longer serve us and focus on the ones that would allow us to build the cities and provide sustainable futures for us and our descendants. Drawing from present readings of the city, past reflection on our heritage, and the future aspiration of a new generation of African people, this panel is an invitation to reflect on what is fueling our construct of modernity. Our first panelist, Wizile uh, Harmans, could not be here, unfortunately, but he took the time to record a presentation, uh, which I will share with you. Hi everyone, my name is Wezile Hamans. I am based in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, my practice is around uh, performance, installation, video, and uh, research uh, materials. Um, I'm going to be showing some of my works and how it relates to the topic and the discussion we're having today. And the photograph here um, is a still from a performance work. Um, the character, uh, I tackled the character, the interrogator. Um, the character is looking and observing uh, uh, how people respond to family and unfamily spaces and kind of predicts what people are saying now and what possibly people can say in the future and also look at um, memory uh, as a as a form of um as a, as a form of that uh that um kind of guides people on how to respond to to these family and unfamily spaces um this same photograph was part of the project that was initiated by the center for less good ideas. And here I collaborated with Frank Machis and uh, this was during COVID times, uh, art spaces were closed and the, uh, the project um, was to bring art to the public and to people. And uh, our focus or other intentions with Frank was to look and observe what is happening in this city, the Johannesburg. And I was more interested on uh, on his poem. There's a there's a paragraph that we agree that we want to display it together with this character, the interrogator. And the paragraph reads: uh, the ganging air, the jobless young, the shaft that injects my blood into the earth and sucks out gold. Uh, me and Frank we are both interested um, on uh, on the reasons why people come to Johannesburg and dating back people mainly came to join us back to work. And the most popular work that was there was um, mining and domestic work. And the city grew significantly. People came to live in Johannesburg and Johannesburg became this vibrant city. 
and people wanted to invest and wanted to do more in Johannesburg and the city grew and uh, also there were a lot of articles and talks of what is what the city holds and what is the future of the city and um, through all this vibrant that is happening here and there was something else happening underneath uh, the production and the mining. Um, the extraction industry has been part of the Johannesburg identity ever since. And the mountainous dams have been a feature of the city so long that barely uh, no one noticed them. Uh, Johannesburg, most disadvantaged residents had to bear all this brunt of this toxic wind that comes from these industries. The workers who constantly have to negotiate their space to work and operate or simply exist in this city because the city became that place of work and go back home and work and go back home. And it was not designed for people to leave and invest in the city. Um, recently, um, there's been a lot of talk about the mining and uh, what it does to the city and the economy, but also what it does to the people. And in 19 July, 2023, um, according to various eyewitnesses and Johannesburg police station, an explosion occurred between Bree and Salmon streets in the city center. Most believe to have been caused by a gas leak. Others speculate that this might be the result of illegal mining activities happening underground. And uh, this is one of the few incidents that most people predicted because of the, the pace the city wa was currently on and how it is designed and, um, and uh, how people had to kind of negotiate in these foreign designs, materials and equipments. And this incident took a lot of lives, uh, businesses and everything had to kind of stop and everyone had to pause and ask themselves so many questions about this city and also this happened in um, in one of the popular streets that hold uh, a significant points to most of the people who use public transport and the residents uh, Bree Street uh, holds two largest uh, taxi ranks um, in, in South Africa, uh, North Taxi Rank and MTN uh, Taxi Rank. Those are the two points where people take taxes to go home, but also take taxes as a regional and also to leave the country. And people use those two points uh, for their face time when they come to join us back. They arrive as a point of arrival, as a point of departure. And the street also holds such a very business hive where there's a, there's a market, there's people, and uh, the incident kind of really raised the questions to everybody about the future of the city, and also me as an artist, and also the character of the interrogator predicting the future and asking how can we build these cities using uh, familiar lenses, familiar equipment, familiar fabric, familiar style, so that they can work on our, on our favor in relation to safety. Um, and also this gas leak is, is that is allegedly the, re the cause. It also makes us question is that the people who design the city, they don't stay in the city. They come to the city and do what they do and then go back to their homes. And the ones that are affected by this is the people who are staying in the city. Now, the question is, what is the future of our cities and how are we building our cities in what, in what materials and what equipments are we using to build the city? Are the equipments and materials familiar to us or not? Thank you, Vizile. Um, the discussion is going to move on with uh, our next panelist, uh, Nick Nonso, uh, hailing from uh, Lagos, uh, Nigeria.
Africa, like you said, the more you think you know, the more you realize that uh, you don't know. So this is the first uh, version of uh, my presentation. The next one, which is uh, pretty explanatory, will be coming up. Yeah. What if Africa had been left alone? So I would need you to direct your face to the presentation. And uh, because your faces are scary to me, more of stage fright. So I'm going to go down. As you're looking at the screen there, I'll be looking at this one in front of me. Thank you. I love the silence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Our final panelist um, for this session is uh, Uzoma, uh, hailing from Abuja, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Nzinga. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so we've traveled to the past with Nick and considered the question, what if Africa had been left alone? And Wezile spoke to us about the conditions of, the present day conditions of Johannesburg. But really that could be more or less any other city in Africa. We have our own present day conditions that we're grappling with. I want to invite you all on a voyage with me now into the future. We've gone to the past, we've gone to the present, and now I want you to travel with me as Afronauts on a voyage into the future. And for this journey, you can close your eyes, you can relax yourself, but I want you to be in a calm, reflective state. The air is whatever you want it to be. We are in Tripoli or in Dakar, 
or in Nairobi, or in Maputo, or in Abuja. But the air here feels different than anything we've known it to be. This is a place of freedom. This is a place of softness. This is a place of self-enriching slowness. This is a city whose social structures are founded on a genuine investment in the moral and spiritual upliftment of self and of others. Because of this, care is taken to ensure that every single person has access to everything they need to live a good life. It's a place that drives you not to spend your entire life hustling to quote unquote make it, but to spend that energy finding everything that is godlike in you. It's a playful city, a city that is full of green spaces and wildlife. It's a city with an evident respect for and reckoning with its past and an aspiration for its future. Let's place ourselves, each and every one of you, as individuals into this city, and let's experience it as a local of that city would. Because that's what we are, we're future ancestors, we are locals of the cities of our aspirations. Here we are enjoying a quiet morning walk with the dog in our favorite park. Here we are going to work with a chest full of fulfillment. Here we are gently and casually walking back home at 2 a.m. after a night out with friends, admiring the architecture of the city, buildings which reflect the social, cultural, and historical traditions of the city, spaces that remind us of who we are. Here you are harvesting on your family farm, which is in the middle of the city, or drinking tea by the river with friends, or enjoying art, or enjoying live music, or enjoying a game of football, or just vibing and taking in the free, fresh air. Here we are feeling at ease, feeling free, feeling alive. Thank you for traveling with me. This is, this is the future. This is the Africa, these are our cities of the future. And sometimes we forget what we are fighting for. We forget what we are working towards, but it's nice to be reminded of that every now and again. And as we listen to all the panels that are going to take place today, and we listen to all the other talks, I want you to remember that this is everything that is being said. Everything that we are speaking about, everything that we are asking, all the questions we're asking, all the things we're trying to reckon with, is to the end that we realize this vision of our cities. This is the dream. These are the dreams that are shaping and are fueling um, the paradigms of the future that we are aspiring to for our cities. And as we continue to think, as we continue to work, as we continue to, to, to live, um, it's important that we, we hold this energy close and stay in it as we actualize everything that we desire for our cities and our continents. Thank you. Thank you, Zoma. We have uh, time for one question uh, for the panelists. Um, any member of the public? <laughs> Invite a reflection, perhaps, yes? <laughs> Can you expand more on human desire, please?
I didn't think about that. <laughs> I was writing a very emotional poem. <laughs> um, but, you know, thinking about it now, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. But I imagine that whatever that is, whatever that aspiration is, because it's a very fundamental part of who we are as people, I would imagine that whatever we're constructing does not have to be at odds with that. It's not some sort of, you know, kumbaya utopia where there's no space for uh, aspiring and, and, and desiring to stretch yourself and, and, you know, but that, I feel like our concept of that in, in the world and in our cities today often comes at the expense of another or of something. And I imagine that in this, in this scenario, it doesn't have to. It's not a zero-sum game. There's, you know, the sky is wide enough for all. It's free seating. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Would you like to react to the prompt? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I will now pass on the the mic uh, to the next uh, uh, panel, which will be moderated by my co-mentor, uh, Hisham Bouzid. Please welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's hard to balance after this uh, very nice poetic gestures. I'm gonna invite also the panelists to join me, Arafa, Femi, and Ellen. Thank you, thank you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Hisham Bouzid. I'm uh, one of the mentors of the Beyond Building program. Very happy to be here today and to be hosted at the new institute. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, so this panel is about vernacular technology, what I, what I tried to call it, following also my, uh, some of my colleagues' reflections on what is a vernacular technology, but to dig into more this concept, I think uh, when we started uh, thinking and uh, with the with the mother uh, the uh, mentors and with the the participants of the Building Beyond program, the question of informality was persistent. Right, we come with the continent where the informal economy is somehow shaping our cities, uh, but rather this informal economy is looking at in a very kind of stereotyped way or in very uh, let's say, uh, a negative aspect of it. It adds something, at least in Morocco, where I come from in Tangier specifically, it is something to eradicate. So uh, the manifestation of the, the spontaneous urbanism uh, that we can see by activities such as people building their own houses, creating social playground, using sidewalks, for example, for commerce, or actually even cultivating them as like, you know, small gardens. Uh, those are all different uh, manifestations that we see in the urban space uh, and uh, we see them as, as, and we describe them as like chaotic. But those different interventions are also uh, uh, everyday people, how everyday people they do exercise the city. So we use the word informal uh, to stigmatize and to stigmatize the population residing or engaging in those activities, which kind of justifies uh, the policies that we have over the informality. It's, 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 you know, different terminology goes out of it, such as like poverty, delinquency, marginalization, vulnerable neighborhoods, and all are among those stereotypes uh, produces uh, the neoliberal policies to eradicate and to uh, kind of implement the general, there is a word that I always have trouble to say, uh, exclusionary mechanism. Sorry, um, um, I, I, I hope it, <laughs> it is understood. <laughs> so, Selame uh, Kofi uh, Agbojinu, uh, who's uh, actually was also a former mentor within the Building Beyond program, and, I'm, and I had interviewed him in the magazine Macan that I also actually presented here two days ago, uh, uh, spoke about the vernacular technology. And uh, he mentioned that uh, is it a system of ethnomathematics? Technology is simply two people coming together 
finding a solution, right? And when you go down to this very simple uh, definition of technology, you think about inform informality as a technology, as a social technology, as people coming together, finding the solution. So how can we think about cities that can are built upon those uh, uh, ethno, you know, mathematics and those uh, primitive or organic technology? So I came from Addis Ababa, where the majority of the economy is informal, and my research is on uh, like self-organized art spaces and their support structures, and how can this informal market be like a support system for these uh, art spaces? So my questions are: How can the existing informal economies be channeled into an operation of formally registered spaces? How can this process be supported and facilitated by the state as opposed to oppressed? How, and what are what avenues already exist that might be exploited, adopted, and made fit? So this is a great skill of the informal, uh, to find a way to persist, to persist in spite of. It's a negotiation of these existing conditions, finding a more balanced way for a more informal and formal economies of the Ethiopian cultural sector to interact that will allow for the development of the stable infrastructure in the future. So during the process of my research, I came across these traditional or indigenous ways of uh, support the society has been functioning with for centuries. Some of these indigenous systems are called Eder and Ekob. Ekob and Eder are uh, Ethiopian traditional indigenous voluntary social security systems uh, or a self-help association for mutual aid um, that could be used in burial, that can be found through almost all the country, uh, both in rural and urban settings, with the aim of mobilizing resources, especially like finance, uh, distributing uh, them on a rotating basis. A coup is temporary uh, and could be permanent, and while it is like a long-term uh, association. In a place where there is no like social security system, this association served by primarily assisting people with uh, self-help self activities or infrastructures and victims with grief, such as funerals and other security issues in the community. There are so many similarities and relationship between the informal market and these indigenous systems in the way they organize themselves, support and serve or as an anchor in the society. Uh, now I will invite you to experience this dis distinctive sound of Addis Ababa's informal open market and the, trader who, who, the traders who drive the daily economy. In, it evokes the experience of the women and the hawkers that are calling out against the backdrop where uh, in the city living. Um, you can see it as a way of stepping into the open market and a quick transportation into Addis Ababa. Thank you. I will, I will uh, pass now to the broadcasting, but can I ask you a quick question? Uh, be, to, uh, to the, is, so if we uh, understand well, it's, it's, it's a solidarity system that happens in between different people mm -hmm. that kind of replaces the, the social security system because people, they are, everyone is uh, uh, participating with some money, I guess, right? Yes. To have like uh, a system where we, if someone's from someone's family passed away or something, the community stands up for this person yes. and pays for the the needed mm -hmm. accommodations to for that specific event. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's uh, like so they would uh, contribute money every uh, week. It could be every month from uh, which areas they are um, they live in usually. Um, it's a small amount every week. So when somebody has passed away in your family, not only for you, but it could be for your kids, uh, who is ever registered in those, uh, um, they are the like book, a small the little book, books uh, that yeah. they, okay. They collect money and it could be burial, it could be sickness, it could be- um, uh, Weddings as accidents, well, yeah. yeah so things. whatever, yeah. And okay. then they would, uh, yeah, support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There would be a sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
So some some people closing their eyes. Uh, it's good it makes a good transition because we're in the markets. We are still in the markets, and I'm gonna pass the microphone to our third final panelist, uh, Ole Femi Suyovo. You're an architect and researcher based in Kutunu uh, in Benin Republic. You also just opened your architecture studio based on research. And please let us know what you think. Hello. Thank you, Isham, for a perfect transition. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for the, um, just like the, the, the sound. So imagine that sound, that just same sound, just like place now from Addis Ababa to Cotonou. So a market. I'm like, why are you <laughs> So we left Addis Ababa, but keep the noise in mind, the noise and the sound in mind. So now we're in Cotonou. Um, today I'm going to take uh, Dantokpa Market as a case study. So imagine just this, this sound with um, street hawkers, with people walking, fruits, vegetables, like smells, women with the wrapper. Imagine just that, but in Cotonou. So I'm going to talk about informality today um, because um, Dantokpa is a case study for that. In that regard, if I take um, vernacular technology, it's something that's called informal, um, it's called something that stems from vernacular ways of practicing and being in, in urban or even in village environment that prevail in the modern city today. So basically, um, vernacular technology and informality is something that existed and that keeps existing. And the thing is that because it's not um, um, cutted for in the modern city, then you always find a way to exist. So back now to Dantokpa. So is this place in Benin, where in Benin we are 12 million, and um, in Cotonou we are 2.5 million, and we have the biggest West African market. It sprawls on 20 hectares, and is a place where you can literally buy anything, electronics, food, um, it's mobile, it's fixed. And at this, in, on this image, you can see in the far behind one building that's just like make the proper build structure. And the rest of it is stalls, um, stalls and people just going around. And it's quite interesting because those people, they pay rent even in the kiosks. They pay rent. There is a proper organization system. There is like a police station. There is like small... Um, daycares and facilities for people, but not just enough for a proper uh, mar market to succeed. So at the end of the day, um, the market 
today, yes. So that's the main building that you see on this image. And all around, there's all of those kiosks and, and, and uh, little installation. The main problem is uh, there was actually fire twice, in, on, actually more than twice. There were fire, and there's also question of proper um, care of, of kids, um, also uh, sewage and et cetera, et cetera. So the market as it's, it is, is a problem for the government. Um, by the way, since 2016 in Benin, we have been having a huge, it's been a huge construction site. There's been construction, reconstruction, mainly is the countrywide gentrification. And because we don't have, um, our system are quite fast, so when, um, in the regard that when there is a lawmaker that takes decision, it just moves rather faster than actually here. So my question in my practice is looking at the city and asking myself, is this built form adapted to our local need? This was a building made by a Beninese architect in the 1960s. Today, um, the government literally built a network of um, 11 new markets and they all uh, in that form built by, by a French company called Arte Charpentier. And it's actually going to be nine markets in the city. It's um, steel structure with a little bit of bricks. So what does it say about the climate? What does it say? To me, it reminds me of a market in, uh, in a banlieue in Paris. So I don't understand why <laughs> this type of market is being replicated back home. And so the question with, my, the question with this market is, what's going to happen to the rent? How are they going to move the supply chain from one central market to now 11 market? What's going to happen to the woman who's struggling to pay rent for the kiosk? Now, is she going to be able to afford um, a place in this market? They've been completed since last year and they haven't made the transition yet. So the question that is always in my practice and that I always have is, how do we harness informality? How do we make sure it's catered for in our built firm? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olefemi. Thank you, Hélène. Thank you, uh, Arafa. And uh, we can take one question from the public. If there is any one and single one question, we can take it. <laughs> yes. Yay. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. But I had uh, you know, a, a fair mind of thinking and uh, I eventually formulated this question in my head and I would like to share it with you so that I can learn more. What do you think are the main significance contribution the vernacular architectures holds for future African cities and overall urban growth? Uh. Femi, do you want to jump on the question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, there is so many things to learn from that. I think the first thing is that um, we back home in West Africa and in, in previously colonized spaces, we were never given the tools ourselves to look at our cities. So just that paradigm change, just sitting there and say, okay, this is what I need and this is how I'm going to do it. That's just the first start. And then when you finally are able to access archive, because that's some, another problem, you, um, you learn so much technological, climatic, and simple things that work. And actually, funny enough, in Europe now, some of the things are being used and, and saying, okay, let's go back to um, things, a uh, way to do things a little bit more traditionally. But we have the chance to still have those things in our geographies, even though we are in these like, kind of like two faces kind of places kind of thing. And we still have time to go back, but also we, we also can lose everything right now. So it's for us um, a question of going back and looking at what we can learn. And for example, on Zinga with her practice, she used uh, earth and bioclimatic material to rebuild um, the city. And it's very interesting in the material, in the language. Um, just one last thing. Concrete is a problem back home because it's hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so it doesn't work for us. And then we built like all of our cities in concrete. There's no other varia uh, variation of material. And it's like just going back to learn how to build with mud is actually better for us. So that's just a start to your question. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add? 
Do you want, are you okay? Thank you. I mean, the debate can go on and on, but I hope that we can take the chance to speak in a more informal way. Uh, just for the t twist. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to pass the microphone to my colleague and dear friend, Dorla Hassanin, for the third panel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, for this uh, panel, I would like to invite uh, three amazing uh, participants. Yes, Sara, Balqis, and Rose. So for today, our panel is uh, titled Cities of Resonance, and it was an attempt for us to go uh, beyond the perceived determinism of the future of African cities, and instead map the resonances in the works of African practitioners, and to link our realities uh, to the material conditions we're under in these geographies. So conceptually, we thought resonance, just the 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 definition of the term itself is something that occurs when a system is able to store and easily transfer uh, energy information between two and more storage, uh, uh, storage modes. Yeah? And in this Building Beyond uh, program, we have been committed to building a repository. So under this theme, our work was to more deal with what's already there, what the practitioners know uh, what they desire to, to uh, build with that knowledge. And so we thought about building a repository of thoughts, strategies, and critical thinking about inhabiting cities in Africa. And we situate the term uh, resonance as a reading of the dynamism of that repository itself. So through creating this, uh, we're consciously attempting to go beyond historicizing effects of colonia colonialization as the main foundation of spatial analysis and social political shifts of our geographies, commonly dictated by positioning the practices in African cities to be still within colonial, you know, post-colonial, as post-colonial knowledge. Um, we rather offer a possible engagement with what is already there that has embodied changes premised on paradigms of political imaginaries of all the different communities that are in these geographies. And in this, through our work sessions and in this ongoing conversation that also we would see all of its kind of dynamism in the publication, um, we've gone through urbanization and uh, modernity literature that have had a distinct consideration of the history of coloniality as a lens of looking at cities um, today. However, a preposition to look at the repository itself uh, as a constellation of frequencies and waves of change within a dynamic system that itself resonates with each other. It seemed to us that it's more of a true reflection of the complexities in our respective geographies. So in resonance, we believe the cohort can exist in vibration with each other, intensified through exchanges, discussions, and the slow and steady building uh, of discourse of dealing with what is already there. So, with that said, we shall start with our very first amazing presenter, um, Balqis. Uh, Balqis Zuhair is an architect and curator who's based in Libya, and her work brings together uh, architectural methods and photo with photography and representational tools to investigate how space and sociality are made in the local context. She also connects the continuity between historical archives and field research with contemporary cultural practices and looks at their con concrete outcomes uh, within the built environment and the collective memory. So I hand over to Balqis. We, look, we all look forward. 
Okay. Hello. Um, I will be looking at the screen on my phone to not lose track of time. So let's start. Um, two, year, two years ago, I believe that one of the most problematic aspects in the arts and culture field in Libya was the lack of archival work and difficulties to access archives as a start. As in the past years, before and after the revolutions, archives have been always restricted, as restricted as weapons. As a result, I started building an open source platform online that contains various types of archival material regarding certain areas, buildings, culture, and different materials. Some of it no longer exists, demolished, transformed, or not accessible. And the most important part of building this platform is giving tools for the users, the option to edit, criticize, and share anything they believe it's important for them to archive. As a way to experiment what collective archiving means to us. However, after working on this project for almost a year, I have observed that the problematic aspect isn't only our lack of archives or access, but mostly, more importantly, the way we're representing our archives and the tools we have been promoting and recycling. And my focus shifted on the focus of understanding and developing a way to have a reference when we're working and archiving in a, com a complex context like Libya. This reference is a reflection on three aspects. Why, how, and when do we archive? As a reaction, this reflection became to a natural and political disaster that happened a month ago in the east of Libya, in Derna and surrounding towns, as you see in the back of the screen, where a flooding have resulted in the passing of thousands of people and displacement of thousands. As this disaster is unfolding, the community and myself witness initiatives, open calls, and a lot of projects that aim to archive, but with no empathy to those who have just lost everything in a matter of hours. These initiatives often started with statements of, we're giving voices, or we are empowering these resilient community. Two sides of statements that we often have seen when we're representing communities in Africa or in critical contexts, with usually a mission of archive. Throughout this project, I aim to understand from where we have recycled these statements and to expand more on a, more of a human approach to archiving and tragedies. And before we start even archiving, ask ourselves since when tragedies have been used as a resource and a content with no sensitivity. To step back and think, are we archiving for the main source of knowledge sharing, documentation, or to create a product? We can distinguish this by asking a set of questions to ourselves, but the most and basic question is how our actions and our archival methods and research are benefiting these local communities and how we are portraying these communities as a start. Thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing insights on this, uh, how we are dealing with catastrophe and what type of um, knowledge spawns out of that and what formations that are being created. And to move on to our second presenter, Sara Fakhri Ismail is a Cairo-based visual artist, a performance maker, choreographer, and somatics practitioner. Uh, their work investigates relationships and narratives of space coming from body and sociality. So please. Uh, hi, can you, oh, okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, my project is about uh, gardens, uh, the disappearance of gardens, uh, the destruction of gardens in Cairo, and, uh, and it's equally about um, assembly and collective dreaming. 
so this um, we work through um, we work through uh, performance um, live uh, live participatory performance and also publishing and uh, this picture is by uh, urbanist uh, photographer urbanist uh, Michel Hanna, uh, who has a really uh, extensive archive of uh, all the gardens that were uh, completely destroyed uh, in Egypt, uh, I think starting 2015 maybe, uh, and until today. Uh, within the project, we were able to uh, acquire 35 of these images. Uh, of a specific neighborhood in Cairo called Heliopolis, which is where I'm from. And uh, most of them are before and after uh, pictures, but this one really, uh, I think, captures me. So uh, I'm just putting it there. And uh, I'm going to read uh, a text um, that may, may or may not be published. Uh, <laughs> okay. So... Um, in my first recent attempt to enter Maryland Park, I approached the park with Rima. It was 2021, and we heard the park was finally going to be open for visitors. It had been a while since I last tried to visit, having lived abroad for years, followed by a couple of years of generative reclusivity. We stood at the gates for a few minutes, we took a few breaths. I observed how and how much of the park directly after the entrance has become a food court. In the image of the Cairo heading steadfast into a bottomless pit of hypercapitalism. The new old Cairo, because new Cairo is another city that is being built outside. But the old Cairo still gets to be privatized completely as part of the new national project, gentrification, development. As we approached the inner gate, the guard at the inner door informed us that only one restaurant is open. We replied that we had no interest in the restaurants, rather that we wanted to go for a walk in the park. He told us to go back to the bigger first gate and ask the other guards dressed in civilian clothing whether or not the park is open. We approached a small side entrance where we could see the rest of the park to the other side of the restaurants. One of the guards came rushing towards us, telling us that it's closed, that we cannot enter. We asked why. He replies, instructions from the government. Quickest way to close an argument. We didn't debate much. Government is code word for there isn't going to be a discussion here or even sometimes fear for your life. The rules change every day. No ground is solid. We were heartbroken. We exchanged stories about the park. We laughed in dismay and embarrassment when we remembered dolphins and swans that used to be held captive, uh, held captive there. We exchanged stories of picnics on holidays with our families. Egyptian Easter, I said, sometimes with my grandmother. Today, there are free birds, some probably migrating, especially in a clearer sky after flight cancellations of COVID, and some you would never have seen before. Stray cats and dogs move freely in and out of the park now, free, to, free citizens as they are. <coughs> we decided to go to a park we knew would still be there, still open called Child Park, with sorrow, but also deciding neither to be discouraged nor dwell in failure. We have to keep going. No time to dwell on failures of this kind. Cairo is not for the faint-hearted. At the moment of denial, I found I needed to find a park first before examining the one that had closed. So I didn't delve into wonder. I only wandered in through my thoughts but I also needed to go back and consider the possibility for porousness in a closed gate with as much caution as possible. I will not become the martyr of the park. I later reflect on that moment, I later reflected on that moment silently. 
I wondered how I had failed to recognize closed gates as part of the story. The part where I have already entered through the past, my memory and imagination, and no longer through the present there. The part where the denial of entry in itself is so emblematic of the circumstances and context of a current urbanity. The part where the denial itself could become a main character against any effort of mine to find ease. A second reflection. We headed towards another garden looking for an affirming encounter, something to hold on to and say that there are still places here where slowing down is possible. Upon entry, I recognized that like many parks in Cairo and probably all of Egypt, Child Park is very much a family space where the family is the original unit of society. Families sat in the park sporadically having picnics. Most of the park was left intact while the corners had been taken over by cafes and restaurants. The park was still in the middle, but the cafes took the corners outside its gates, welcoming all sorts of spenders into those corners. On the inside of the park, also a cafe, a traditional one where you could find two kinds of sandwiches, cold beverages, and a few kinds of tea. An unassuming, unbranded cafe with plastic chairs. We enjoyed a walk and had a little set down on the grass. I laid down. Nearby, a group of young women did their sitting guided meditations and invited a type of silence into the space. Cats, of course, roam free. And even street dogs had their own territory in the park. I was glad to see them comfortable and friendly, despite the religious heritage of the neighborhood and families' fears and dislike for street dogs. This is a place where life slows down for many, relative, of course, to their proximity to the somatic norm and their ability to blend in within society. We had entered Child Park unwillingly to take defeat after being turned back by the guards away from the Maryland, disappointed, but still intent on going to a park. Rima suggested Child Park in Nasser City, a neighborhood that is so close to our house. So we headed there. On our drive away from Maryland, we exchanged stories and memories of time spent there and what it had meant for us. I recalled an image of my family meeting another family there for Egyptian Easter. The parents are friends and the children, including myself, are distant, destined to be so. I recalled an image of my grandmother and an image of the swans in the lake. I didn't know which of these images was from memory and which I had forged from imagination. Rima said that she used to go there with her father. Rima reminded me that there used to be a dolphin show, something that we would both stand firmly against now, an activity we would refuse to take our children. I thought about how the adults of the time didn't think anything of it. They seemed too busy with other pressing matters. For a few moments, Rima and I tried to see if there was a way we could pay some kind of fee or bribe to be let in. But a moment came when it became apparent we were not going to enter. So we turned back and we left. On our drive away from Maryland Park, we exchanged stories, Rima and I. We didn't want to dwell on the failure to enter. Sometimes it's hard to consider the failure because the implications are too political too personal, too anger-inducing. We don't know how to process failure to enter because it's a non-event. It's a non-event because there is always the likelihood and because it's not productive. We would rather be unproductive in a park. I can't always be making projects about things I cannot do. It doesn't do me justice. But, and so, I didn't take a lot of time to consider this non-event event of being kept out of and denied entry. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this great account. It's important to, to see what plays out in uh, these experiences. Um, and for our, our next presenter, it'll be 
uh, Jibu Career Rose, and she's a curator based in uh, Nairobi, uh, alongside artists and affiliated, uh, affiliating practices. She works to create uh, opportunities and spaces to encounter each, other's, in, each other in areas of interest. Her recent work uh, is in participatory design and space making related to infrastructural or institutional forms, enabling circulation of artistic and curatorial practices in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am a curator. I live and work in Nairobi. I have been thinking with uh, the infrastructural forms that enable artistic practice in Nairobi. And I will say, as well as many scenes around that, that share similar conditions. And in this, uh, since 2017 until today, I have come, I've made like a quasi-survey or quasi-mapping of art infrastructure in Nairobi and in which I have understood or would like to understand it as an elusive infrastructure. And I, I uh, so I'll, I'll read a bit. So uh, one of my first reflections in a quasi-survey study I made in 2017 is a discussion of absence and lack, especially in thinking about actual physical infrastructures. Uh, for instance, there, can, there are no art museums as a statement. It was evident to me that a lot of things that are, that are present only that we, that are, uh, it was evident to me that a lot of things are present, only that often we do not share the same symbolism. It occurred to me that many initiatives and spaces for many reasons have operated for a short time and died or transitioned. One, um, so, and then I came uh, across this um, publication. It's a zine by Oela. And there's this title, Caring for Soil is Caring for Earth. Everything that has lived can live again. And it was interesting for me to think with this that everything that has lived can live again as a, um, a provocation. So, um, from which I started to think about transformation, decomposition, and recomposition of spaces for circulation of art practices in time and over time. Uh, spaces that no longer exist in the ways they did when they were instituted. For instance, Pi Pa. You can go to the next slide. Um, a space for gathering since 1965 by artists, uh, a, co a collective. But right now, um, mostly a home for Elimonjao and Fildenjao artists. The same space has also uh, gone through catastrophe of fire and split due to family land disputes, through which it is further composed. Uh, as an explanation for the rise of gated communities in the city, why people build walls, Elimonjao says in the 50s, when there were students at Makere University, we lost the taste of the soil. When asked by the colonialist if you are in Mau Mau, one said no. And if asked by Kenya Land and Freedom Army, one said yes. In this way, I continue to reflect on how infrastructure eludes us. On it, Coleman tells us when our group plays, before we start out, before we start out to play, we do not have any idea what the end result will be. Each player is free to contribute what he feels in the music at any given moment. We do not begin with a preconceived notion as to what kind of effect we will achieve. Um, and maybe to tie in with the question for human desire. Uh, Onet speaks of the unshackling from tradition that is possible only through free group improvisation. There is no lead solo. We find each other in the music and in the poetry we make together, creating and dissolving meaning. We think of what it means to be free in this neoliberal, heteropatriarchal world. Making together does not attempt to change the world, but it could be a node among many, seeping into the structures that maintain the dehumanization of others, eating away and weakening oppression. In co-imagining, we seek to 
imagine a different future, and make towards its realization. It lives in multiple forms, across bases, street corners, WhatsApp groups, emails, text messages, with friends, family, and even with strangers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our presenters. I think we have a f some time to open up for one question. <laughs> yes. It's at the front here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Leonard. I'm um, from Zimbabwe. I think uh, part of what's happening is I was burning with this reflection as you're talking about your Cairo story. Uh, so much relatable in, that, in what we do uh, in terms of urban green spaces and the presentation before, which was talking about the informal sector. And I think for the way I could relate, where you talked about could I be the martyr of the park, is that we had a similar project we were working uh, with back home. What we realize is that what we're failing to do is you're failing to communicate the value, right? Um, as I was looking at your tree, I was like, people can't hold sacredness to join um, in, in union to protect those spaces because we're not communicating value. So gentrification comes, we're doing a $1 billion project, it's gonna provide 5,000 jobs, and guess what? The one who can communicate value wins. So what we started doing is we started developing these uh, numbers based, because people were very quantitative, right? Uh, like for example, the tree you shown there, uh, a, a mature tree like that uh, cools air up to 100,000 cubic meters. And you're like, if you are experiencing urban heat islands, it's because you just murdered a 100,000 cubic meter worth a cooling machine, right? And once you start doing that, people kind of bring that sacredness back. And the same thing with uh, the parks. Uh, the reason why we have billionaires so in, 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 in Manhattan and because of uh, you know, Central Park, um, the, the, the land value capture in development and preservation of parks should be communicated. Local authorities, if you preserve this park, you're going to uh, collect property tax that you know, increases the value of what? Of your properties. So the same thing comes to the informality of the spaces when we look at uh, you know, these uh, informal markets. It's the same thing. You know, I like the concept that was being spoken about in Topia that you, know, you got this uh, revenue collection stream where why aren't we putting an asset backed facility that actually uses the same revenue collection within, because it's like an insurance company, a funeral policy, but it's not being invested in. So as, as what we, I had to do, corporate finance, actually start preserving these parks and work on these informal, uh, because what we're failing to do as creatives is to get into the same field of finance and bankability of projects. And finally, I'll say, and I'm looking at this artwork and we have a current project we're working on, these guys have a sculpture park they told me that uh, our work, because it's original, with stones worth up to $3.5 million, but they could not renovate their you know, park. Challenge being, they have this uh, asset-based facility within stonework, but they don't know how to collateralize it. To, to So a guy comes in, I'll give you 500000 to put up a retail market, they'll take it you know, in exchange for that value. So I think as a reflection point, part of what we really need to put in and emphasize on bankability of project, investment structures, what does it mean to preserve this in value terms? Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying about the value. Um, I, I really do, I hear that. Uh, I think um, it's important not to inflate a person's uh, agency for, for me, I'm speaking strictly because I live in Egypt, uh, which is uh, a place where um, there is a, um, the urban design reflects a national project that is very anti-assembly, which is uh, a reaction. The, the disappearance of the garden is uh, closely related to making the roads bigger and uh, making them like highways. And this is a direct reaction to the assemblies that happened in 2011, which caused a revolution. And uh, so it's a way to make sure that the city is not walkable anymore. This is not something uh, that we can, uh, that we have agency over. Uh, we, so it doesn't matter how much we communicate the value. Uh, we can't revolt again, we are tired. And uh, we, 
I don't know. We, we can't we can't intervene in this, uh, you know, the way that it's going. Um, this is a government that has support, supported uh, and uh, celebrated even um, uh, in a in an uh, um, in an implicit uh, way or a very obvious uh, way by so many other governments, and uh, it cannot fall. Uh, because it's very important in the world, in the global uh, structure of things. Uh, and so, because it cannot fall, then we cannot assemble. And it doesn't matter how much we value anything, because we don't matter. So I just wanted to clear that out. Uh, but I don't want to destroy anyone's dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to add on what Saya was saying, that this scenario works perfectly when you have a clear connection between the community authorities in a very stable context. But we're talking about a context that you can wake up the next day and the building next to you is demolished with no notice. There is no connection. I believe that the more we talk and think realistically about our context, the better we can navigate through it. We don't have the power to influence the authorities because for them, they're the experts and we are just the receiver. So the more we are disconnected and we create our own agencies and platforms, the easier for us to navigate and make actually a, a small differences. Yeah, thank you. I um, wanted to I also يعني, understand, uh, of course, that there has to be some form of literacy, financial literacy, in all these practices entangled into um, a market. And I think that work has to also run simultaneously to the creative prepositions that are based on these um, informal connections, or let's say things that are more considered unseen or uh, do not have like direct formal readability, right? To, to uh, uh, yani the state apparatuses. But I think that we should be also careful that um, if we do not generate new architectures of rendering value, then we risk just assimilating into this whole thing, and it becomes. I mean, I think we would then reach a point where it just is impossible to break out of, right? I mean. That is something that is already set, you know, that is the, the, the dominating or domineering uh, architecture of rendering value. But there is stuff that's sort of, I would say, I always call it floating and fleeting things that are of value, but also help sustain um, communities that are expelled from, uh, you know, the, this main conversation, precisely because they don't have value to the state. Um, and um, we see, you know, just referencing also Belkis's presentation about these catastrophes, these things are purely state-made, like literally uh, purely man-made, these types of catastrophe, and they're cyclic. So um, it really, you know, you'd have to be very careful, uh, and, and I, I definitely agree that it has to be a literacy, you know, that goes some, you know, uh, simultaneously with other practices, uh, but with the very clear understanding that you can, it cannot be everything. It cannot be the only way to go through, through stuff, right? Um, because then we just risk really uh, completely eliminating what is left that's kind of um, in these sort of floating and fleeting spaces. And, and these aren't necessarily just, of course, uh, spaces, but also the potential of having different, you know, like imagining uh, different political ecologies, you know, so you have to, um, you know, things have to move in different trajectories and also achieve a form of multiplicity, you know, like that there is a possibility for all us to live differently as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I totally, I, th I definitely think it's not something that the, you do not engage with, you really have to have some financial literacy with that. Um, I have to wrap up, obviously, very quickly. Um, thank you so much to our presenters. And thank you, of course, uh, for having us. And I would like to hand over to... <laughs> but... <laughs> 
I'd like to hand over to uh, Kinsani Yurtik de Klerk. I nailed the name, no? And uh, we will be having our final uh, panel, and I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Work? Yes, thank you. Um, everybody that's sitting on the stairs, if people could scooch in a bit, then everyone can sit on the bench. Thank you so much. Thank you. And whilst everyone scooches over, I'd like to invite the three incredible panel panelists on this panel to please join me at the front. Thank you. Yeah, it's getting cozy. That's good. That's good. That's brilliant. I stand here. Well, it's really an incredible privilege uh, to to uh, yeah be in conversation and witness these. Um, these practices. My name is Kensani Yurchok de Klerk, as, as Ola uh, mentioned. And uh, the title of this, of this panel really focuses on reimagination. It's uh, uh, titled From Imagery, uh, or Imaginary, sorry, to Image. And um, you know, in, this, in this panel, we'll be asking what, what are the implications, the, the frictions and possibilities of spatial storytelling in geographies that we've heard uh, are embedded on imaginaries that operate to exclude. Uh, as spatial practitioners from, from various disciplines, we have the incredible privilege of making images of imaginaries and, and also, of course, prompting imagination from images. And those images, of course, come in, in various forms, in the forms of experiences, of visuals, of buildings, uh, of rituals. And in African geographies, and cities where the very conception of the built environment and material conditions are often premised and manifested uh, on images of exclusion, what strategies and possibilities could or, or have existed to resist controlling images of African modes of being? So what are controlling images, right? Um, controlling images, uh, we, we lend this term from um, Patricia Hill Collins who writes so exceptionally in her Black Feminist Thought that controlling images are, they're produced by media, by institutions, dominant members of society, and are designed to really make racism, sexism, poverty, and other forms of social injustice appear to be natural, um, to appear to be normal, appear to be inevitable forms of everyday life. And so when we speak about resisting controlling images, how do we take it, uh, take it upon ourselves to do that? We've heard a lot about informal practices today. We've heard a lot about those modes of exclusion. And so in this panel, we ask lots of questions and um, the panelists will answer many. Uh, perhaps they'll answer just one. Um, but we really take this as a cue. You know, we, we ask what, what the role of your various spatial practices um, plays, uh, particular, particularly um, uh, spatial practice uh, of storytelling. How does that, um, what role does that play in evolving modes of being uh, and Im through image making? Uh, how can joy uh, be practiced as a, as a mode of refusal? Uh, we've heard a lot about catastrophe um, and, and refusal is often a tactic um, that is used in order to survive. Uh, how can encryption, uh, camouflaging, strategic risk shifting be used to share knowledge while safeguarding uh, when in expulsive conditions? What does your practice, what does your practice look like? Um, that, or, or what does your practice look to <laughs> or like um, when, when it's when it, um, unhindered by those modes of exclusion? Uh, what strategies might we collaboratively formulate uh, here today in the future to allow that practice to exist without collapsing into the cracks designed by controlling images and modes of expulsion? And finally, what tactics and tools might we use might we name uh, that help us refigure the conditions in which we practice, recognizing such efforts as practices in themselves. And so by dwelling on these imaginaries, uh, we call out upon through images, uh, to images beyond. What will the effect of your practices uh, be when unhindered, as mentioned before? And so we'll take that as a, as a cue, as a prompt to um, really get into a conversation about the, the practices on the panel today. And I'd like, by, I'd like to begin by introducing our first panelist, 
Our first panelist is uh, Mikael de Moussin. Um, Mikael is a storyteller, translator, and social sculptor based in Cape Town, South Africa. His work centers around storytelling for and with marginalized communities and design for social impact. And I hand it over to you, Mikael. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kansani. Um, so I'm gonna stand. Bismillah, okay, we're going for this. So this is a story about love. This is a story about love for home. It's about who gets to make that home and who gets to occupy it. Bell Hooks defines home place as a site of resistance. Hooks notes that it is a place where we can recover our wholeness, where we can be affirmed in our minds and hearts, where we can restore ourselves the dignity denied us on the outside in the public world. The controlling image of the nuclear family and its associated familiar structures uh, are often exclusive of the queer experience. And yet, to black, indigenous, people of color in South Africa, home is more than just a structure to us. Home is intrinsically interwoven with ancestry and spirituality. So when we are removed, uh, when we are um, robbed of home or removed from the image of it, we lose more than just material space. We actually lose everything that grounds us. Worldlessness for us is a condition of being uprooted from everything that holds us at our center. I grew up fear fearing expulsion from my community. I grew up in an environment in which home was neither safe nor welcoming. I was always conscious of these binaries in my culture, these binaries of black and white, where women wear black and men wear white. This interplay of color, this symbolic reminder of gender lines was such a clear and tangible binary. Black and white was the cause of a lot of discomfort. I had to ask myself constantly, what does it mean to learn to love my culture even though it doesn't accept my very existence? Self-similar to my personal struggles with identity, contradiction and hybridity are things that many South Africans relate to. The fragment itself of the South African state is born out of violence, settler colonialism, unprocessed trauma. It is a place torn because of the dualities of its being. As people at the margin, we fight dual battles, one in our cities and one at home. The landscape at the margin is in constant motion and it's defined by an ephemera ephemerality. In that way, home exists in a precarious position and home is rendered invisible out of necessity. Being a coolie, a descendant of indentured South Asian laborers in Natal, I also navigate a duality of place. I think about how my ancestors, uh, I think about my ancestors and how they longed for a connection to a place that they no longer called home, and how they sought to build a home place on the southern tip of the continent. I've inherited a transgenerational identity crisis, a desire to create an imaginary or a home in my own image. That is the baggage that I carry. That is the crown that I wear. What does it mean to take root in shifting soil, to yearn for home, for resolution, for belonging, set against or within the condition in which the domestic is a locus where heteronormativity is most firmly rooted? Spices were the historic vehicle for exchange, or rather extraction, between European powers and Indian Ocean cultures. As a motif, spices are uh, an important part of all South Asian households. We use them to cook, but also to perform rituals. We uh, use them to uh, remove nazar, the evil eye, but we also use them to um, celebrate when we have weddings and, and other events. Spices are a memory of home, of the controlling image, uh, as well as how my community is held by it. When we interact with spices, we are left with a lasting residue, an irritation, a smell, a sensation. Spices and the controlling image of family affect us through that proximity. Where existence for me is an act of refusal, joy is a mechanism by which I escape these fraught realities. I think about my practice as a means to cope, a tactic of rejecting the controlling image by developing my own worlds, punctuated by fiction, uh, contradiction, complexity. In creating my own camp home, I cannot just feel safe, but celebrated. My imaginary is not occupied with futuristic ideas of queer utopia. 
reconfiguring and recomposing the controlling image seeks to create a domestic imaginary where we can be welcomed in our fullness, in the contradictions that, that make up our being. For me, it's about normalizing the mundanities of everyday life. It's about stability and permanence for a community that has been denied these two conditions. It means washing lines in dense urban suburbs in Cape Town, where you'll see thobes, um, you'll see musalas, but you'll also see jockstraps. It means a home for me is my chosen family. Home is hybrid. Home is complex. Home is loving because in this crazy world, we have nothing to do but love. And I end with a provocation that is uh, borrowed from an exhibit, a recent exhibit. We can be happy and wet in a building exploding. Thank you. Thank you, Mikael, um, for sharing with us. It's, uh, it's also very incredible to see how you employ that fiction through um, the, the image making that you're, you're preoccupied with. Um, I will uh, introduce our next panelist, who is um, Rania Atef. Rania is a, um, a visual artist, uh, a researcher, and a cultural practitioner based in Cairo. Her work explores the notion of play across a wide range of mediums, text, drawing, installation, and video. She focuses on different forms of labor within the context of care and invisibility and their intersectional trajectories with art. Thank you, Rania. Thank you, Kinsani, for this introduction. Um, I'm going to read the letter uh, that's addressed to artist um, Mireille Lederman, Euclidus. Um, she's an artist who is known for her feminist uh, and service-oriented work, and she's the initiator of the concept of maintenance art. Um, dear Mireille, I hope this letter finds you well. My name is Rania, and I'm a little bit hesitant how to introduce myself, but I remember when you wrote in your manifesto in 1969, I'm an artist, I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, and you mentioned between brackets random order, so I can present myself the same. I'm an artist, I'm a woman, I'm a wife, I'm a mother in a random order too. I got introduced to your work in 2019 when I was doing different kinds of invisible labor of washing, cleaning, cooking, fixing objects, supporting, transporting, maintaining the life of a child, traveling for studying and working as an artist. It was very hard to separate my art research from my everyday tasks and responsibilities. These were the things that were and still occupying my mind and thus they reflected on my own work. Your manifesto was so inspiring and very supporting, and it keeps me wondering that you wrote it in 1969, and I'm speaking now in 2023, and still we are questioning the invisibility of care work on different levels and its relation of being and working as an artist. I think of tactics and maneuvers and possibilities while approaching art foundations and art spaces. I'm trying to approach them through creating a guidebook that speaks to them. It sheds light on how to recognize and include caregivers in their structures, a more of solutions and alternatives to existing needs. Or maybe I can call it a little bit of imaginaries where things can reach. Or I can call it simply practicing hope. My idea is to start from the assumption that these spaces which are considered sites of labor do not know. I want to take things from the invisible state to the visible state and to change the feeling of being constrained to the feeling of support. So what do you think about suggesting putting changing tables in bathrooms or paying for kids' flights and meals or making morning screenings and openings? I plan to put illustrations and drawings to make suggestions and ideas more clearer. So I thought of this idea of the guidebook, where we as caregivers can express our needs and our invisible maintenance work. How we can function as artists if we are in the overloaded mode, like a washing machine. 
Perhaps the idea of caregiving can be extended to art and institutions too, so it becomes a mutual relation where every partner is giving care to the other. As art has been evolving about the object, the product, the output, but it could be more associated with everyday life and relations, leaning towards building up more supporting structures. A different way to think about art infrastructure. I believe all this work by you, other women, me, initiatives, manifestos, handbooks, and conversations can be flushed up, if I may use your word, to consciousness and exposing them to the art scene is definitely kind of showing care to others. I wish we could have more an opportunity for a conversation and I wish I could have more time to explain to you more about the guidebook and hear from you feedback, uh, but I have a limited time, limitation of reading the letter in five minutes. So <laughs> till we meet. Thank you. Anna, I think I've stick to the five minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rania, uh, for sharing this very um, uh, intimate letter with us. And uh, we, we were actually speaking, you know, the, the artist that Rania addresses this letter to is, is still alive. There's often this new practice of um, writing letters to people who are no longer. So hopefully this um, can be sent to the, to the artist. Um, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our final panelist uh, for today, or this, let's say, session, uh, Anna Rakal Makava, who is an architect, an urbanist, and um, has a special interest in urban interventions that bring together the youth and the arts in the production of knowledge. Their works include interventions in alternative and abandoned public spaces, exploring themes such as informality, improvisation, and experimentation, ultimately creating spaces for spontaneous encounters as an alternative way of consolidating youth-led artistic expressions, using the city as a stage. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And I know that a lot of thinkers and my colleagues and all of us, we are interested in thinking beyond the binaries, but I just wanted to justify myself and say that I'm going to use the binary as a framework to articulate uh, some of my experiences back home and here. So I also share that desire to go beyond this binary. My experience here in the Netherlands has been very interesting. We have visited Rotterdam, we have visited uh, Amsterdam, and art, uh, architects, uh, studio practices, we have seen a lot, and I'm very, very inspired, but very confused, because I'm trying to do the math when I go <laughs> home, right? Um, in terms of the city, the city structure, infrastructures, public transports, everything seems to, seems to be working. At least it appears uh, to be working. And um, it's rendered as the desired state of things. And I don't want to be talking about what is not or what not. I could be talking about uh, the top-down uh, system that it's very present in Netherlands, uh, urban thinking. I could be talking about gentrification and um, demolition, but I would like to, to, to think about my context, right? And uh, I wanted to say that the logic that uh, from which Netherlands urban, that Netherlands urban planning is operating is, it just do not work for us. So, yeah, it's it's working for you guys, but uh, in Maputo and Cape Town, I'm sorry. It's yeah. I think that the set of questions that Africans bring to the table. Uh, don't find uh, answers in this uh, Western neoliberal logic um, way of coming together. And with my task and our colleagues' text of uh, imagination 
of this hard task of imagination, uh, the imagination of liberated futures, uh, the process of imagining our urban spaces back home and confronted with my experience here, I have to start by acknowledging that my imagination is becoming even more atrophied because, yeah, it's, it does something to you when you see an artistic studio with 20, 22, 22 uh, 3D printers when my country only has two. So it does something to you and you start designing th desiring things that will not respond to what you need, you know? So by acknowledging that, that my imagination has been hacked in a way, I begin to present my work and my challenges, right? Yeah. So I work with abandoned, abandoned, uh, abandoned buildings and I also work with uh, young artists young artists that uh, are part of a bigger youth that is dealing with what we call the weighthood. So weighthood is this word that is trying to describe that liminal phase where a person is no longer an adolescent, but it's not becoming an adult. It's hard to pay the bills. It's hard to, to finally be socially recognized as a fully person. And the reasons behind this struggle, this very, very hard phase in our lives, has a lot of political and social, uh, it's influenced by a lot of political and social conditions that we are going through. And it's, and it's hard. And my argument is that uh, African uh, youth is not simply waiting for things to unfold and for adulthood to be given to them. So to give you a, an idea, we are dealing with a lot of precarity, we are dealing with a lot of it, uh, unemployment, we are dealing with a lot of improvisation. And today, um, I come from the perspective of a, an abandoned building that I'm going to occupy in November with a, with a phot collective photographic exhibition. This is a render of, of it. So for me, that abandoned building represents a lot of things. It's an abandoned structure, just the slabs and, and, and columns. And it's a building that has been witnessing a lot of changes in, 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 in our geography in Maputo. The building witnessed a lot, uh, including the 2420 event, which when uh, Mozambique won the Revolution, uh, Revolution War, when we gained independence in, this, in 75. Uh, our government, Frelimo, gave uh, 24 hours and 20 kilos for the Portuguese people to leave now. So the building witnessed that, and the building was abandoned, was half built, uh, not there. And for me, that building represents a lot. It's a representation of, of, of the refusal to participate on the urban dynamic. For me, it, it represents the, the disinvestment in whiteness from which we have to start walking through. It represents uh, an opportunity for us, the youth that is struggling, to rethink our future and to experiment the, and bring new images, create new, new spaces for us to come together and articulate our conditions and find ways to go forward. So I, I align myself with this refusal of the building. I see it as a platform I join my friends, uh, especially people that are dealing with photography, and we're going to occupy this building temporarily. The building, it's not that people don't want to occupy, the building simply refuses. It doesn't open doors for investment. Uh, they have tried, don't get me wrong, they have tried, but it fails. And the only time the building opens the doors is for artistic pro uh, projects. So once a year, twice a year, we see some festivals occupying the building. We see the agency of the building in resonance of our agents, agency. And we want to use our agency to imagine new liberated futures. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Anna, Rania, Mikhail. Um, I, I'm getting the signal that we have time for one question. 
And uh, that'll be the final question. So, so please, um, if anyone has a question uh, or a remark, an offering. Everything was no? clear, no? <laughs> well articulated. If there are no questions, last um, one last check. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for all of your talks and presentations. Um, and a question about this hacking of the imagination. Um, and it's just a simple question about what what now. Like, what are you going to do with that, this newly articulated imagination, which in a sense has been contaminated now and has to emerge as something new? So do you, have you thought about what this means and what's next and how this is going to build into relationship with what you're currently doing? Thank you for your question. I, I have to start acknowledging that it's a hard task. And during this trip with my friends, dear friends, I'm so, so happy to be part of this group. I think Sara, Ola, and Rose um, gave me some kind of relief because I work in museum settings as well. I work in a very, very structured institutional form. And we have been thinking a lot of how to not perpetuate the violence that those institutions do to us, that those formats of, of exhibiting do to us, specifically in the context of Cape Town. And when these three people that I mentioned made me think about the idea of disappearing, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to be thinking about that. Because we are putting all our efforts on that reckoning with the, with the hacked imagination, with the given solutions that we find here in the Netherlands. We're like, oh, it's working. That, that hacking makes us invest all of our energy in trying to fix things that can just disappear, you know? So I think my first step when I go back home is to think what happens when all of this disappears, how we can do what is next. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I just have a few reflections on that. Um, I think for me, I was always aware that our imagination was hacked. I don't think that it was a, a, a profoundly new thing to come across. I think there's this incredible um, uh, well, reflection by Sara Ahmed in Queer Phenomenology, where she speaks about orientations and uh, orienting oneself towards certain outcomes, certain objectives, and what we actually place at our center, wh what it is we're actually chasing. And I think in a, in a non-Western context, specifically in African context, the center has always been Europe and the Western world. And so much of the way that we live our lives, so much of the way that we conduct ourselves as artists, as practitioners, is defined by Western standards. So really, it's a process of disorientating ourselves we actually need to be aware of the fact that we are already oriented towards the West in order to, be con to consciously deconstruct that, to actually find out the ways that we can now form our own imaginary that we can occupy. And this program is a great way to do that. I think through our shared solidarity, through the stories that we've all uh, resonated on, we've realized that we are building our own imaginary. We are building our own tools to unlearn these methods. And I think the other question becomes, we're in this um, in this uh, public presentation where we are the subjects and you are the audience uh, and many of you are from this context. Um, I, I think the question really becomes, we, we don't want to be the subjects of your sympathy either. We really want to make sure that we can ask you to help us uh, find solutions. Th this project, a problem was not created by us. This problem was not created by the West alone but it was further exacerbated by the West. And you need to be part of authoring that solution. Uh, we're not asking you to write the solutions, don't get me wrong. But we do need the resources and we do need to build our capacity in order to make meaningful change in our, in our context. So this question really becomes, how are you going to be a better ally? And what are you going to do in order to further this conversation? Thank you.
And with that, I think um, we'll be having further conversations. <laughs> We'll be having further conversations um, after the panel and uh, we'd like to once again thank the panelists and really everybody in this cohort for this incredible conversation.